Let's pray together again. It's good to lean on the Lord, and prayer is leaning on the Lord for all things. Father, I thank you that we can trust you. I pray, Lord, that even as I speak this morning, as we speak, others speak, Lord, and all of us uh, desire to hear from you, that it will be out of a leaning. Lord Jesus, save us from earthly ideas and intellectual ideas, Lord, and our own human boxes that we put you in, Lord Jesus, and the pursuit of knowledge that will kill and puff up, that we might receive life, Lord Jesus. Only you can give life. I come to you humbly, Lord, and I share, I, I, I um, lay myself on the altar that you would use me as a vessel and use us, Lord, for the purpose that you have on this earth. This time here, Lord, is not the most important for our spiritual growth. It's what we do with it. Give us ears to hear what you are saying through your Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, open the eyes of our heart. Open the ears of our heart that we might receive understanding with all of our hearing. That's my cry, Lord. Pour your Spirit upon us. We humbly ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. I thought I would start with our memory verses from last week and uh, this coming week. It's First Peter 1, no, um, this last week was Revelation chapter 3. I'd like you to turn there with me, please, so you see it in God's Word. Whether you actually get up here and say the memory verse out loud, it's not as important as that we know it and that it's written on our heart. The word of God that will save us from sin. You can keep a finger in Revelation 3. I'll come back to it. But the word of God that will save us from sin. We're told in Psalm 119. Verse 105. Is the word that we have hidden in our heart. Psalm 119. Not verse 105. I think it's verse 15. Verse 15. Not verse 15 either. Verse 11. Psalm 119, verse 11. What is the word of God that will protect us from sin? It's the word that we have treasured in our heart. And the reason we have um, uh, the children memorize the verses and the adults too as well. We hope that you will also memorize the verses it's mostly for us adults, the children set us a good example, is that through constant reading, meditation, memorization, will come a treasuring and a hiding. That's what that word treasure means. I've hidden your word in my heart, some translations say. A lot of people are eager to hear God's word so that they can say something about it, preach a sermon about it. A lot of people think they have the gift of prophecy that when God speaks something to them, they must tell other people about it. It's not always the case. God may give us specific words that he anoints us for. And most people who think they have a word from the Lord don't. But that must just be the tip of the iceberg. The iceberg underneath must be the words of God that we have treasured and hidden in our heart. And it's no wonder that we've got a Christendom today that's full of words, more sermons today than have ever been preached in the history of mankind, and yet perhaps the most diluted church condition. Um, because there isn't that treasuring inside, that treasuring of the word in our hearts. It's the word that's treasured in our heart that will keep us from sin. So let's keep that in mind. And this verse in Revelation 3, verse 21, He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. That's why we must know what it means to be overcomers. That is why the message of the way of the cross and the resurrection life in Jesus is so crucial. Because these words were spoken to a church. And I believe Jesus is speaking that to our church today. Let's not think, oh, 
It was the church in Laodicea, backslidden as it was. It was to the messenger in the church in Laodicea, and unfortunately, it was also an indication of the most, most of the church there as well. But the message is the same to us today. RLCF, and not just RLCF as a whole, but individually, if you consider yourself a committed member of this church, and even otherwise, this is the message of the Holy Spirit. It is the ones who overcome who will sit with Jesus on his throne. A few weeks ago, I preached a message about how there is a multitude in heaven that can't be counted. Cannot be counted. And then there is a countable number. It's called 144,000 in the book of Revelation. It's not a, it's a symbolic number. But like that, you know, somebody who has a minimum mentality towards God will read Revelation 3 verse 21, which says, he who overcomes. By overcome, he means you're overcoming sin. God is strengthening you by the power of the Holy Spirit to be done with bad moods, to be done with grumbling and complaining, to be done with lust, to be done with anger, to be done with uh, jealousy, envy, evil speaking, bitter thoughts, unforgiveness, all these things. He wants you to overcome them. And the minimum mentality person will say, well, can I still get to heaven if I don't overcome? And I don't, I'll tell you honestly, I don't have a word from God in the Bible for such people. I do see Jesus saying, he who overcomes will sit, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne. And you could add to that if you want, well, if I don't overcome, at least I'll get to heaven. There's no such verse in the Bible. <laughs> but I don't, I, I don't know. That's all I can say. I do see the Bible speaks about overcomers. And when I see God laying before me the opportunity to be an overcomer or not, I say, Lord, I want to be an overcomer. Whatever this sitting down with you on your throne, that's what I want, Lord. This is eternity we're talking about. Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever to sit with Jesus on his throne. He's offering that to you and I. And I don't want a mentality that just says, well, Lord, I, I just want, I don't want to really have you set me free from the fact that I go through periods in my life where I'm just miserable, gloomy, depressed, defeated by sin, defeated by sin. The other verse that, we, the verse that we're memorizing for this week is from 1 Peter 1, it's verse 16. Verse, let's begin reading in verse 14. As obedient children... 1 Peter 1, verse 14. Do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. In other words, if there were things that were part of your life before you became a Christian and you didn't know that you're not supposed to lust, that you're not supposed to get angry, that you're not supposed to gossip, not supposed to have bad moods, not supposed to be discouraged. Okay, that's fine. But don't, as an obedient child, don't be conformed to those old, th old things again. 2021 should have been different than from 2020. 2022 should be different from how it's been this year. But like the Holy One, verse 15, who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior. Because it is written, this is the memory verse for this week, you shall be holy for I am holy. Now we know that the kindness of God leads us to repentance. You know that verse? Romans chapter 2. I remember hearing uh, Brother David Wilkerson once say about how he, the, his favorite sound in, when preaching was the sound of turning pages. <laughs> I'm assuming he went to some churches where people didn't bother to bring their Bibles. He said I, his favorite sound was the sound of the pages turning to the verse that he was referencing. I like that too. Romans chapter 2. Verse 4, or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? And I want to start what I'm sharing today by saying that it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. But if we only know the kindness of God in an earthly way, 
then we will never come to the place where we really become overcomers. If it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance, it is the fear of God that will lead us to victory over sin, that will lead us to overcome sin. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. Um, and let's use an example. In Luke chapter 15, you know the story of the prodigal son, right? Let's turn there, Luke chapter 15. Remember this. It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance, but it's the fear of God that will keep us from sin. The kindness of God draws us back from a sinful life, and it's always there. It's not one or the other, it's both. Together, the kindness and the severity of God. Behold the kindness and the severity of God. The severity is a big word maybe for children. Um, by the way, before I pass, move on, I, I was visiting a place recently and I told the children there, I was speaking for the whole weekend, and I said, at the end of this weekend, you must come to me if there was anything that you didn't understand in what I said. And I might have said that here in this church here before, but I want to say it again, especially children, if you're old enough to understand English, if you're old enough not to understand what your parents say, and you hear any of us teachers, or any of us who share something here, and you don't understand it, you must, not you may, but you must, <laughs> I command you <laughs> to come to us who spoke, whoever it was that spoke, and say, Mr. Santosh, I didn't understand what you said. Can you explain it to me? And I hope to explain it to you in person and do a better job of explaining it here. In a world that's full of people that are speaking at an intellectual level where only the PhDs and the highly educated people can understand, I believe Jesus would speak in the simplest, simplest way possible. It wouldn't impress people, but it would change their lives for all eternity. And that's our goal in this church. We don't want sermons that people can get big heads over, including ourselves but sermons that penetrate the heart, the work that only God can do through the Holy Spirit. I pray every time I speak now, Lord, I don't want to impress people. I don't want them to think it was a great message or anything like that. But you take my feeble words and do something through your Holy Spirit that touches their heart. That's what I want. In heaven, we won't be playing back our sermons. Our hearts will be revealed and the effect of those sermons will be what matters. And as elders in this church, the four of us have a responsibility that we present you perfect in Christ. You know, Paul says that's our ambition, that we may present every man perfect in Christ. That means sometimes we'll speak words of rebuke, words that are firm, but also words of kindness. And what you won't see is the labor and prayer that we do for this church, individually and together as elders. But that's our goal is that at the end, when God reveals the hearts, he'll see, he will show the effect of those sermons. Not how big and how much they understood it, but did it have a work in their heart? And so it's kind of like us putting these words out there and trusting that the work of the Holy Spirit will come and penetrate the hearts of each one of us. So if you don't understand anything I say, children especially, our adults, please come to us. Luke 15, we know the story of the prodigal son. And you see what it was that caused him to turn when he came back to his father, when he started to go back to his father. He went there, and as you know, he was hired by a man to feed his pigs. And that man cared so little about this young man that he wouldn't even allow him to eat the pig food. That's how little he cared for him. He says, I don't care about you. My pigs are more valuable to me than you. I just need you to make sure the pigs don't die. I don't care if you die. That was the situation that this prodigal son was in. And, and that's a picture of the situation that all of us are in if we remain in sin. We were in sin and that was our condition, whether we realize it or not. We were in a condition where the devil really didn't care what happened to us. In fact, he has only evil intent on his mind when it comes to us. Sin will only disappoint. Sin will only leave us feeling frustrated and feeling used. And that's what happened to the prodigal son. And then it says, verse 17, things turn. The kindness of God now, is, he opened his eyes to see the kindness of his father. But when he came to his senses, he said, my father is kind, essentially. 
My father treats even his slaves with kindness. How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father. It was the kindness of his father that led the prodigal son back to his prodigal father. Prodigal just means lavish, wasteful. And the prodigal son came back to a lavish father, a prodigal father. But I've thought, you know, often when I read a story like this, I, I, I go back and I see what caused the prodigal son to leave in the first place. And I'll tell you what it was. It was because he lacked the fear of his father, a reverence for his father, the fear of God, you can say. Now put myself in this situation. What is it that causes me to go away from my father's house? What is it that leads me back into sin? What is it that would lead such a young man to go back to the far country? Because the time is going to come when his stomach is filled again. He's eaten the food from the father's table. And now he's kind of living in his comfortable life, but the famine is over in the far country. Now his friends are having a good time again, and they send him a note, a text message saying, hey, guess what? Things are good now. We're having a party again at such and such a place. What is it that will keep this young man in the father's house? The reason that's an important question is because that was my story. And I'm sure every one of us can testify that that was our story as well. That having tasted the goodness of God and tasted the kindness of God, we wandered back into sin. Now, it may not be that we're falling back into drunkenness and debauchery and I don't want to use that word because that's something that children won't understand. Horrible sin. Yeah, we may not be going back to those things, but all sin, every sin, speaking to my wife in a harsh way, uh, uh, being irritable, being impatient, being lacking in kindness, being full of envy or jealousy, falling back into lust, all of these things are leaving the Father's house. And why is it that Christians still leave the Father's house? I believe is that because we live in a Christendom where much is spoken about the kindness of God, but very little is spoken about the fear of God, living in the fear of God. And unless we learn the fear of the Lord, my dear brothers and sisters, and unless we learn the fear of the Lord, that'll be our story as well. We'll go back into sinful behavior. And it's perhaps that many Christians have a false understanding of the fear of God. They think that the fear of God means that I must be afraid of him, that he's waiting to either spank me with a harsh spanking or throw me into hell forever. That's the devil's false the devil's lie about the fear of God. Just like the devil has counterfeit everything. There's the counterfeit baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's counterfeit tongues. There's counterfeit prophecy. There's counterfeit everything, preaching. There's everything that can be counterfeit. Counterfeit apostles. If you don't believe me, read the book of Revelation chapter 2, where John, through the Holy Spirit, says, there are them who call themselves apostles, but they're not. And there was a church that he commended for saying, I'm happy that you expose counterfeit apostles. And the apostles are those that were used by God to oversee elders, to plant churches. So if there's a counterfeit, all of these things, there's also a counterfeit fear of God. And the devil would love to take some, even a message like what I'm preaching right now and say, hey, no, you know, you've been bound. Maybe you came from a church that taught you the false fear of God. That God is waiting to punish you and is an evil taskmaster and he's out to get you. And you equate that with the fear of God. And so now whenever you hear the fear of God, you think of that. And the devil successfully gets a lot of people to miss out on this overcoming life. Which can only come through the fear of God. By saying, oh, fear of God, no, tune out. Because, you know, remember what happened to that other church where they taught the fear of God. And so, yeah, just like... A lot of people tune out when they hear that they must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because they say, oh, you see that other Pentecostal church and how they do this crazy thing and all that. So, no, that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit rejected. No. Don't throw out the genuine because of the multitude and the abundance of counterfeits that there are. If there was a world full of counterfeit $100 checks, would you then... Turn away every $100 check. Whenever you get a $100 check, check it. It might be real. <laughs> and it might be valuable to you. Just because there are many counterfeits doesn't mean that the original is not there. 
So the fear of God, the fear of God will keep you from sin. I want you to see this, for example, in the, in the testimony of Job. Job was a God-fearing man. God-fearing. That might be a word that we just say, God-fearing. You know, even today you may say, oh, that's a God-fearing person. It's a God-fearing home. You go there. What does that actually mean, to be God-fearing? It means you fear God. It means, very simply, that you recognize that God is watching everything. That's what it really means to be God-fearing. I pray that my life will be known as a God-fearing life. I pray that my marriage will be a God-fearing marriage. I pray that my home will be a God-fearing home, that my children will be God-fearing as they grow up, that as a church will be known, this is a church that is God-fearing. What does that mean? We recognize that God is watching everything. And you know, really, this is the beginning. There's a proverb that says, Proverbs 9 verse 10, I think, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of your journey. Do you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Do you want the kindness of God that leads you to repentance? I tell you what, it starts with the fear of God. And I believe that it was a lack of the fear of God that led that prodigal son out of the home in the first place. See, when the prodigal son came back home, if everything was, as they say, hunky-dory, a comfortable life, oh, yeah, the robe is on my my you know, robe is put on me, I've got the ring on my finger, sandals on my feet, and wonderful life. But you know, the time would have come a couple days later when the father had to rebuke the prodigal son because perhaps from his wanton life, he just got up at 11 o'clock in the morning when there was work to do in the farm. And the father said, son, the first day, maybe the father was merciful and says, okay, I'm gonna be long-suffering with my son because he's come from a lazy life that he's just been living. But after a while, before the son went to bed, the father was sent to him, son, it's been a few days that you've been here. Your health is back to normal. Now you need to get up at six o'clock in the morning with me. We have work to do. And then comes a test. Do I just love the kindness of my father that brought me back? Or do I fear my father? Do I have a reverence for my father that says, Lord, I hate that life so much that now when the belly is full and, and I've got plenty of sleep and, and life is good, and now I hear a word of rebuke from you and a word of correction and a, and a command that says, now you must obey. You must be holy as I am holy. Now what do I do with that? At that point is the test on whether I really have the fear of God or not. It's when I've been in the Father's house, when I've tasted his kindness and his goodness. Now what is it that will keep me in the Father's house, that will protect me from going back out there because I'm tasting the Father's kindness. His kindness will not end. His loving kindness is how long, children? Everlasting. <laughs> it will not end. And I must not allow the rebuke and the correction and the call to obedience to be an overcomer to cause me to take my eyes off of my kind Father. It's the same Father who says, you know, um, uh, in, in another place in First Peter, he says, if you address as Father this holy God, how much more must you live in reverence in the days that you live here on this earth? If, if you called him father, that should mean that the fear of God is even more in your life. Not that you've eliminated it from your life. My calling him father now caused me to say, this holy God who can tolerate no sin in his presence has taken a great risk in calling me, sinful me, into his house. See, God hates sin so much. Sin is a dishonor to God. It's a disgrace to him. And he's taking a risk by inviting sinful me to come into his presence. In fact, he did that when Jesus became my sin. When the father sent his son to become my sin, he took a great risk. Because his hatred for sin could not be diminished at all. And he had to find a way that didn't lower his hatred for sin while making a way of salvation for me. And he says, I, I gotta hate, I still hate sin. I gotta find somebody that can deal with my hatred of sin so much. Jesus, will you go and bear the brunt of my hatred of sin? Let's look at that verse because I, we can miss it so easily. First Peter chapter one is actually right after our memory verse. Let's continue reading. You shall be holy, for I am holy. And then he goes on to say, 1 Peter 1 verse 17, If you call as Father 
the one who impartially judges according to each one's work. Read that sentence slowly and carefully. This judge is God, judges impartially according to each one's work. Now when you say that you're his son or daughter, don't imagine that he's going to say, oh yeah, you're my son, daughter, it's okay, you can go ahead and sin. Just keep, that's what in another place is called licentiousness. The grace of God become an excuse to keep sinning. Oh, God will give you mercy, it's okay. The blood of Jesus will cleanse you from sin. Remain in that sin. It's a false gospel. Conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. If you saw that it was the blood of Jesus, he goes on to say in verse 18, the, it was not a perishable, it wasn't even silver and gold that God had to spend. Silver and gold is like such a low thing compared to the precious blood of Jesus. When you've seen the precious blood of Jesus and what it cost for the Father to bring you back into his home, what should you do? Now that you're in the house, it should cause you to conduct yourself in fear. Live in the fear of God when you're in the Father's house. The true fear of God. I'll talk about that here. But Job is a man who didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit in him. You don't need the fullness of the Holy Spirit to have the fear of God. Job didn't have it. You don't even need the law. You know, a lot of people say the law brought fear. Yeah, it did, but it just made it a little bit more clearly. You could have had the fear of God without the power of the Holy Spirit and without the law because Job was a man who lived before Moses, before the law was given. In fact, most theologians agree that Job was the first book written. He lived perhaps around the time of Abraham, sometime then. Um, and Job, long before there was a law that says, you shall fear the Lord your God, Deuteronomy chapter six. Long before that was given as a command, there was something within him that we all have, which is an, a conscience that recognized there's a God above. He's holy. And I tell you, we have that much more than even Job did because we receive teaching that tells us. We have the word of God that says that God is holy. Job didn't even have a Bible that told him that God was holy. He just knew it in his conscience. God, you're holy. And so I better live in the fear of God. And so a man without a Bible and without meetings you know a lot of people are taken up with today like oh we can't meet so no wonder there's sin no sin has nothing to do with whether you meet or not encourage one another yes to do what to live in the fear of god all the encouragement you receive in this church or in any church for that matter will do you no good on tuesday if you're not walking in the fear of god job it says in verse one, uh, chapter one, verse one, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job and that man was blameless. <laughs> I think it's Job writing about himself, by the way. And uh, he says, I'm blameless. And he wasn't lying because we'll see in a few verses that God himself gave the same testimony about him. Upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. Why did Job turn away from evil? Because he feared God. That's it. No, oh Lord, give me the power of the Holy Spirit and I'll bat a little. No, you feared God. Enough. He turned away from evil. Now, our stand, now the evil he turned away from was much lower, a much lower standard than what we're called to. And the standard that we're called to certainly does need the power of the Holy Spirit. But it begins with the fear of God. And all are crying out for the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, set me free from this sin. I fell again and I did that again. It's going to be no use unless... We begin with the fear of the Lord. Job had it. Now in verse 8, we see that this was the testimony that the Lord gave to Satan. More and more, dear family, this is the testimony I've come to covet. You know, let, let it be for the other people in the world that people say, oh, he's a godly man, that's a godly woman, he's a godly person. Let it be for the others. I'll tell you, there's only one person, one testimony that I crave. I want... God to tell Satan. The testimony of God to Satan. This is the one thing I covet more than anything else. Whether you all think I'm a spiritual person or not, whether my children even, I hope they do, my wife, all that, there must be the evidence of it. But ultimately, you drill all the way down into who I am underneath all these layers that you all see. Some of you see more layers than others, but deep down, God sees 
who I am. And it's his testimony to Satan that matters the most. Think about it, dear family. Over this last month, we're at the end of the month now, almost at the end of the year. What is God's testimony to Satan about you? He's watched everything. He watched how you were here. He watched how you were in the workplace. He watched how you were at home. He watched how you were in the bedroom, which was just you and your spouse. And then he watched what you were thinking when your wife was asleep and it was just you and your thoughts. Your husband was asleep, your thoughts, your motives, your attitudes, what you planned to do the next day and the next week and the next month, all that he was watching. And what is the testimony that God will give Satan, does give Satan today about your life? That's important. Because one day that's the only thing that will matter. That is gold, silver, and precious stones. That's the thing of eternal value. God's opinion of you. That he can brag as it were to Satan. Saying like he said about Job. Have you seen? Have you considered Satan? My, my servant Job. There's no one like him on the earth. He's blameless. He's upright. He fears me. He turns away from sin. The fear of God will cause you to turn away from sin. It's the kindness of God that will lead you to repentance once you're in sin. But it is the fear of God that will cause you to turn away from sin. Fear of God is also how we learn to worship. Because you read later on in this chapter. It's the fear of God that allowed Job to go through such an incredibly trying experience as he went through. In one day he lost his entire possessions. all Everything he owned. Everything he owned. All is, you know, the equivalent of money. Everything in the bank account, the stock market crashed, the, in, the retirement fund failed, the, everything was taken away from him in a moment with no hope of getting it back. There's no insurance that would cover it for Job. And then he lost all of his children, every single one of his children, in one moment. I've never heard of a human being in the history of mankind that has suffered in an earthly sense like this. I believe Jesus suffered more than Job. Jesus suffered more than any human being. But Job suffered more than any earthly human, in an earthly sense, you can say, from earthly possessions. I've never heard of such a man. And yet, how could such a person, without the power of the Holy Spirit within him, without a Bible, without a command that says, in everything give thanks, without a command that says, rejoice in the Lord always, again I say rejoice, without a command that says, be anxious for nothing, but with, in, but with thanksgiving, uh, let your requests be known with the Lord. He didn't have such a command, but he had the fear of God. You see how the fear of God will preserve you, brothers and sisters? You really don't need a Bible. Now, thank God for that. Thank God that he make, makes it clearer. The word of God should only be that which I'm building on top of the fear of God. Otherwise, I could read the word of God and, and study it and know that, that what this means and that means, and I could even preach to others, but it means nothing. Because it would be like me giving this book to Kalia. <laughs> there she is in the back. Does this book have power? Oh, it does. I, I, not a day goes by when I don't read something from this book. But I put it in Kalia's hands and it means nothing. You know, put any book in her hands, it means nothing. Why? She can't read. But the moment she can read, when it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning, you think of it like this, it's the ABC. Before my children can learn to read this book, they must learn ABC. Before they learn to read the Bible, they must learn ABC so that they can read the Bible. And if the fear of the Lord is the ABC of wisdom, wisdom is Christ, Colossians tells us. The riches of God's wisdom is Jesus Christ himself. Before you can really know all wisdom, which is Jesus Christ himself, learn ABC. Otherwise, you could be reading Christ and reading Christ and reading Christ. And it's like Kalia. I'm not picking on her. I, I hope she'll listen to this sermon in a few years and understand what I was trying to get at. But... Um, it would be like her, you know, for her it's just, oh, oh, it's a nice book. It's got some gold tint page and things like that. And a lot of people are coming to Christ and, and, and just playing with him like he's this. Oh yeah, nice Jesus. But they don't understand. They haven't got the ABC of it. The fear of the Lord. Reverence for God. And it caused Job in verse 20, when Job, after all of this happened, as soon as he heard these words in verse 19, verse 20, Job rose up. He didn't have to sit there and mope for a week. You know, that happened later, unfortunately. But his immediate response, the immediate response of Job, which comes only from the fear of God. He arose, tore his robes, shaved his head, fell to the ground and worshipped. 
The fear of God will allow you to worship through the most difficult storm of your life. Oh, that's the cry of my heart. I don't, I don't, I don't pray, Lord, take me away from storms. Lord, keep me safe from the storms. No. I don't even pray, keep me, you know, safe in the midst of the storm, safe in the midst of the storm. There may be hymns like that. I say, Lord, I want to worship you in the midst of that storm. Whether I make it through the storm or not is irrelevant, but I want to be found worshiping you in the midst of this storm. That's what Job had. That's what Jesus had in the midst of the storm. What was Jesus doing when he was hanging on the cross? As he was about to take my sin, as he was about to become my sin, he was worshiping God, his father. He's worshiping. There, he taught me the way of worship. Job is written as an example for me that I can hear these horrible news and it's not Job worshiping at chapter 42. It's Job, Job worshiping in chapter one. And God is gonna, gonna, uh, it's gonna be a while before God opens his eyes to see the great purpose he's doing. It's gonna be a while before he gets back. And for us in the new covenant, we may not even get back. Some of you may have lost children that you'll never get back. Some of you may have lost things in this earth that you'll never get back. Earthly things, I mean. And that's irrelevant. But in the midst of that loss, can you worship? If you fear God, you will. If you fear God, you will. You know, that, that's, that word worship, the first time it's used in the Bible is actually in Genesis 22. A powerful chapter where Abraham's about to go and offer to God that which is most precious to him. I believe Isaac was even more precious to Abraham than Sarah was. If God had said, give up Sarah, I'm going to take her home, Abraham would have been like, yeah. <laughs> I don't mean that in a bad way, by the way. I think Isaac was the one he waited for 100 years for. And he's like, okay, Sarah, she's kind of old. It's okay, Lord, if you take her. Please keep her. I love my company with her. But Isaac, he's the promise of the future. I waited 100 years for this. I've had Sarah for 80 years, he could have said. But I've waited for Isaac for 100 years and I've only had him for like 15. Isaac was that which was most precious to Abraham. And God said, I want to prove that you fear me. Let's turn there quickly, Genesis chapter 22. Verse 12, as he, um, Abraham was about to pull his knife down onto his son Isaac, he said, do not stretch out your hand. The Lord, the angel of the Lord called out to him and said, do not stretch out your hand, Genesis 22 verse 12 against the lad and do nothing to him for now I know that you fear God. Pause for a moment, dear family, and think about that which in your eyes is the most non uh, the thing that would be hardest to give up. You don't have to put your hand and say it out loud, just between you and the Lord. This is a transaction that Abraham had to make. I believe, you know, in the beginning of chapter 22, I see Abraham laying in his bed at 11 o'clock at night. He can't fall asleep. And God tells Abraham, I'm going to put my finger on that which is most precious to you and I want you to give it up. And he labors through the night and says, Lord, no, not that. Not that. And he's trying to think about, could it really be? And then the Lord says, yeah, that's it. I'm going to take him away from you. And right at that moment, he says, at that moment, you know what Abraham was facing? Abraham didn't think that God would hold his hand back. He was prepared to just say, Lord, Take him away from me. That's, I'm giving him up to you. It's yours. He's yours. And in that moment, God says, I know that you fear me because you did it. And God didn't judge him over whether, you know, I'm, I'm sure there were complicated thoughts going on in Abraham's mind, but God didn't judge him over all, over all of that or even that doubt. God says, I know you fear me. This is, he says, now I know that you fear me. So God, the fear of God will allow God to even take that which is most precious from us whether he takes it physically or takes it from our heart. That must be the reality for all of us. That which is most precious to us, God wants to circumcise it in our heart, first of all, whether he actually takes it from us uh, or not. God is watching. This is what it means to live in the fear of God. There's a, uh, a few chapters later, Genesis chapter 39. I want you to see a descendant of Abraham. Here's another man. These are all men who didn't have the Bible, didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit within them, but they had the fear of God. And for us who seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit, who have God's word in us, and we meditate on it, we memorize it, we read it, 
if we're laying that foundation of the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit on something other than the fear of God, I want to tell you, it'll just fall apart eventually. And it'll lead us back into sin. It's no wonder that so many people that who, who analyze God's word and speak about and seek for the power of the Holy Spirit end up, you find out years later, they were living in adultery. There was some secret sin they had or they stole money from the church. All this stuff's going on. Because whether it was genuine or not, I'm here, not here to judge that. But anything, anything that we have in the Christian life, even the new covenant teachings that we have, if it's laid on a foundation that's not the fear of God, the fear of the Lord, it's going to fall apart. Here was a man named Joseph. He'd been mistreated by his family. His own brothers had sent him into captivity. Before that, they tried to kill him. And then they thought, yeah, that's maybe a little extreme, even for the brother we hate so much. So let's just sell him into captivity. He goes and works for Potiphar. And God blesses his work there. And he's working hard for a man who's gaining the profit of his labors. Joseph, slaves didn't get any income. They didn't get a bonus. They were just slaves. They just did it for the sake of doing it. Yeah, must, master gets the bonus. Who benefited from Joseph's hard work? Potiphar did. And then Potiphar's wife tempts Joseph. And look at Joseph's response. Genesis 39, verse 8. He refused. It says she kept testing him. She kept testing him. Kept testing him. He refused and said to his master's wife, Behold with me here. My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. And he has put all that he owns in my charge. There is no one greater in this house than I. And he has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. So first of all, Job has, no, not Job, Joseph has a consideration for his master. Because of the fear of God. The fear of God will allow, will cause you to think of others ahead of yourself. Why should Joseph had been, why should he have been considerate of his master? Here was the master who was taking advantage of him. He's a slave. And his master was nice to him. But still, it's his master. And it could have, any slave could have seen this as an opportunity to usurp. I'm going to get back at his master. Like Jesus says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Look at Joseph. He didn't need that golden rule that Jesus gave. He had the fear of God. The fear of God caused him to put himself in Potiphar's shoes and imagine what if this was somebody else trying to take my wife away from me? How would I feel? I can't do that. The fear of God. But more than that, it says, he recognized that God was watching. He told Potiphar, you could lock the door. Potiphar may be gone for two weeks and there's no chance. We could hide it so well that nobody would ever find out. We could turn off the lights. But God is there. Remember this, children, if you're listening. Remember this. Wherever you go, God is there. He's watching. Remember, God is seeing everything. It's a verse in Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs 15, verse 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. They're in every place. You cannot go anywhere on this earth that God is not going to see it. You may be able to hide it from your parents. You may be able to hide it from your wife, your husband, other people in the church. You may be able to hide it. And it may be sexual sin. It could be words you say. But God is watching. God is listening. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. We must remember this. It's, it's when, we, when we recognize that, that we realize that we come to learn the fear of God, the fear of the Lord. Because otherwise, you know, Jesus said that, and we speak about this also because we're called into the new covenant. The essential difference of the new covenant, let's turn there, Matthew 23. These are two verses that contrast the new covenant perhaps better than any other verse that I can think of offhand. Matthew 23, verse 25 and 26. If you ever want to know the essential difference between the new covenant and the old covenant, go to Matthew 23, verses 25 and 26. In, the, in verse 25, you see the old covenant. The old covenant was essentially you cleaned the outside of the cup. You cleaned and made sure that your behavior that everybody else sees is good and clean. The words that you say, the things that you do, how you dress modestly, how you conduct yourself, what kind of um, things you do on the outside, all of this is the old covenant. 
And the scribes and the Pharisees clean the outside of the cup religiously. They pick little spots. Oh, there's a spot. And their meetings were full of, hey, there's a little spot. And they clean that little spot. There's another spot. Even towards themselves. They judged others, sure. But among their little clan of people, they were like cleaning these little spots in each other's lives. But it was all the outside. Cleaning the, the cup so that I can show everybody in the world. See, look at my clean cup, my clean cup, my clean cup. And inside was full of robbery and self-indulgence. And they held up their cups so high that you couldn't actually see what was inside. And their cups were definitely clean. But then Jesus came and said, listen, my cup's not up here. Here it is. Look. When disciples came to him in John chapter 1, they followed him. They were trailing him like secret service agents. You know, spies. They want to spy on Jesus. And all of a sudden, Jesus, you read it sometime. He says, hey, are you guys following me? And they're like embarrassed. You know, you've ever spy, spy on somebody and uh, then you get caught. And the spies usually run away because they don't want to get caught. These two, I think it was Andrew and James maybe. And they said, uh, where are you staying, Lord? He says, come, come and see. You don't have to hide in the shadows to see what is Jesus like when nobody's looking. Come to my house. See what my bed is like. See what's on my bookshelf. See what's on the on my computer come come see i don't have to go there and delete anything or anything like that come I, my life's an open book jesus came showing us the inside of his cup and saying you can too you can also have an inside that's clean you blind pharisee he says in verse 26 first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also the secret to an exterior life that is a good testimony to the world, but more importantly to the, devil, to, to, to the devil through God, is that you clean the inside of a cup. It's a magical cup where if you clean the inside, you ask the power of the Holy Spirit to clean the inside, the outside will also become clean. Otherwise, we end up, even with all this talk about the new covenant, new covenant life, new covenant church, we end up with an old covenant experience. And that's worse New covenant words with a world, old covenant experience. I believe, I, I tell you, I was uh, guilty of that for many years. I knew all the doctrines. I was raised in it. But the reality of my inside of my cup was it was filthy. And I thank God for showing me through the fear of God. The fear of God will cause you to focus your eyes on the inside of the cup. First of all, to Jesus, to see his cup was clean on the inside. And then you look, take a peek on the inside and say, wow, I too can have that, Lord. A cup that's as clean as Jesus is inside? Thank you. Otherwise, we live a life where we're constantly watching how our behavior, I think especially around each other. You know, in a church like ours where we're seeking to be a family and kind and loving to each other, we could be so nice in an exterior way, but we could harbor secret sins, secret bitterness, secret unforgiveness, secret bad motives, bad attitudes, secret jealousy. Where I'm jealous of how God has blessed somebody else but hasn't blessed me with the same blessing. Usually material blessing. Or even gifts. God has given somebody else and given somebody else a calling in the church and I want that and I covet that. And we could continually come with clean cups every Sunday or every Wednesday on Zoom and, or, or where if we meet in person on Friday, Saturday prayer meetings. We clean outside cups but we're harboring a little bit of evil, a little bit of an evil intent towards my brother or sister, a little bit of jealousy, a little bit of envy, a little bit of bitterness in my heart. Eventually, something will come up where the cup gets shaken and I just erupt and I just send that hurtful text or I uh, say that harsh word or I, I let it out to my husband or wife about how I have this bitterness inside. And what, what happened? What, what should I do when, when that outburst happens, outburst of anger? Or my, my children could irritate me and irritate me and irritate me. And finally, I come home and I just kind of lose it. I'm just kind of rude and uh, just uh, avoid dad. He's in a bad mood today. How do, I, how do I move past that? Do I just say, oh man, I'm sorry, children. I lost my temper. So I just try to tie up my tongue a little bit better so that I have more human self-control over that? Or do I fall on my face and say, Lord, I don't have the fear of you in my heart. It's no wonder that I'm still falling into these old sins. The fear of the Lord will cause us to clean the inside of the cup. How do we learn the fear of the Lord? I'll just close with this. Um, 
Deuteronomy chapter 6, that's a verse I referenced earlier. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. You shall fear only the Lord your God, and you shall worship him and swear by his name. You shall not follow other gods. I believe, I found in my own life that one way to learn the fear of the Lord is to remove all other idols from my life. Now you might say, Santosh, I, I'm not an idolater. I don't have any idol in my home. The idols are in our hearts. I'll tell you one idol. Um, Proverbs chapter 23. One idol that was in my heart for many years that I'm seeking to be rid of completely. As far as I know, God has removed it, but there may be unconscious areas I want him to remove. Proverbs 23, verse 17. Here's an idol. It's the idol of envy. It's the idol of seeing how God has blessed somebody else, and I envy that. Now it says here, do not let your heart envy sinners, but I say this, do not let your heart envy anybody. And that envy and jealousy where I see that God blesses somebody in some, a particular way. I'll tell you, from years ago, there was a, a time in my life where I envied somebody else's preaching gift. And I tried. I was like, Lord, I want to be a preacher. I want to be an evangelist. Actually, it's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be one who could go in the streets and, or even meet unbelievers and just have a powerful word from God that would draw them to Christ. And I envied others who had it. And God, as much as it might have even come deep down from some burden to reach the lost, there was envy mixed in with it, and God could never use me. And every opportunity I had to speak was just futile. It was just like churning. It was a churn. Nothing came out of it. It was words of death. It didn't bring life in, in, in others. And then God freed me from that envy and says, Lord, I don't want anything. I want to be a worshiper of you. And in order to worship you, I want to fear you. The fear of God will come when you remove idols. Idols over how much money somebody else has. Uh, what kind of house somebody else has. What kind of car. What kind of job. What kind of ministry. Um, family. History. Upbringing. All of these things are idols in the lives of others. That uh, Idols in my heart because of what I see in somebody else's life. Do not let your heart envy sinners, but live in the fear of the Lord always. You see the secret? Once you let go of that envy, say, Lord, I'm done with thinking, comparing my life with others. Done with it. All of a sudden, the fear of the Lord fills your heart. You live in the fear of the Lord. Um, go back to Proverbs chapter 2. Let me show you something else here. Proverbs chapter 2. He says in verse 5, Proverbs 2 verse 5, then you will discern the fear of the Lord. In other words, something must happen. You might cry and say, Lord, I want to fear you. Something must happen in order for that fear of the Lord to come upon you. See, fear is something that you can't manufacture. You have it. Just like the fear of, of, of scary things, right? I mean, I don't, uh, I don't have to teach my children to be afraid of a wild beast. <laughs> it's there. It's in our nature. You're born with it. There's a, like, whoa. Whoa. You don't have to teach fear. It's just there. And this fear will come into our lives. Just like that, when we remove the hindrances to the fear of God. The hindrances to the fear of God. I already talked about this idol of envy. Here's another one. But he says, then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. When? One, first of all, verse one, one and two. When you receive my words, this is God saying, through, uh, uh, represented as wisdom. My son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. This is how I understand, understand it very simply. Meditate on God's word. This is another thing that comes as a result of reading God's word. And now, when I read God's word, I say, Lord, I want to fear you more. I don't want some intellectual understanding of this truth so that I can share it on Viber or come and give a sermon on it. No, Lord, I want to fear you. So, Lord, I want to receive your words. I want to treasure this book. I want to make my ear attentive to wisdom and incline, lean my heart to understanding as I read this book. Then you will discern the fear of the Lord. And I've started to fear God more the more I've come to God through this book that way. The more I read the Bible that way, it says, Lord, I have only one agenda. I want to fear you more. 
so that I can be an overcomer. Secondly, cry for it. If you cry for discernment and lift your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, say, Lord, I long for this. I, I desire it. I want to be more like you. And I know that the only way this can happen is through living in the fear of you. Then you will know the fear of the Lord. It will just, all of a sudden, there will be a reverence for God. There'll be a reverence when you come into these meetings that we have here. And I don't mean that we have to, you know, superficial fear, like act holy. <laughs> You know, we're a family, so you can be yourself. Come as you are. But inside, there's a reverence. When we come at 10, 15 and we start praying, and you bow down or you're sitting there in the chair, or you're standing up or however, is there a reverence in your heart? Lord, I want to fear you. I want to fear you more. I don't want to just sit here casually, just like, oh, another meeting, okay. I want to fear you, Lord. I want to learn to fear you more. Oh, how it will change our lives. I'll, I'll really close with this. <laughs> the book of Ecclesiastes says this. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting book. I don't claim to fully understand that book. But there are nuggets in there that give me a little bit of understanding of what, that mean, what this book means. At the end of it all, when you skip down to it, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. The words, verse 11. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 11. The words of wise men, perhaps even the words that I've spoken this morning, I hope so, are like goads. You know what goads are? They poke you. They nudge you. Like you, you, you use it to send things a certain way. Send the animal. It goad you on. Get it to run faster. A goad. And masters of these collections are like well-driven nails. They are given by one shepherd. Capital S shepherd in my Bible. But beyond this, my son, be warned. The writing of many books is endless. In other words, all these wise words, you could keep writing endless books, endless books, endless sermons. All these sermons and meetings and prayer meetings and Bible studies and, and racking up all of that is endless and excessive devotion to books is wearing to the body. And that's a danger we could be in. That's an excessive devotion to this book even <laughs> in a false way. The conclusion when all has been said is fear God. Let your devotion to this book be because you want to fear God and you want to be devoted to Him. Fear God. Keep His commandments. Obey Him out of that fear of Him because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. Amen.